Welcome, friends, to another edition of Economic Update, a weekly program devoted to the economic dimensions of our lives and those of our children. I'm your host, Richard Wolf. <clears throat> I want to begin, as I have been doing now for a while, by alerting you to the fact that one of you, Charlie Fabian by name, has volunteered to collect and transmit to us suggestions, ideas, resources that any of you might have to offer uh, as to where we can go to plan and produce segments for this program. Simply send any suggestions you have to charlie.info438 at gmail.com. Once again, charlie, that's C-H-A-R-L-I-E, charlie.info438 at gmail.com. Today's program, we're going to be talking about manufacturing in the United States, about an amazing strike at the California State University system, about missiles in the Red Sea coming from Yemen and interfering in global trade, and finally, the struggle between the United States and the state of Texas over how to deal with the problem of immigration. Important topics, and we're going to race right through them in order to try to get at some of the core issues. Okay, let's start with manufacturing. The last dozen presidents have promised to reverse the decline of manufacturing, by which they have meant the shrinking role of manufacturing in counting all the jobs in the United States economy. Once upon a time, this was a country that spent most of its time working in the fields, in agriculture, or in the factories, in manufacturing things. But both the manufacturing and the agriculture have long since shrunk to pale shadows of what they once were. And it's true of agriculture, as most Americans pretty well now know, but it has become true of manufacturing as well. We are, therefore, a nation, the overwhelming majority of jobs that exist are in what are called services. Services we perform, one of us, for the others of us. And manufacturing, which is considered to be a basis of modern prosperity, a solid foundation for a broad-based and diverse economy, well, it's been shrinking. The manufacturing jobs moved out of the country in the last 40 or 50 years in a growing flood that presidents promised to reverse, every one of them, Republicans and Democrats alike, and every one of them failed to do so. Unfortunately, most of them failed to be honest about their failure to do so. And so they picked photo ops when they could appear with some manufacturer and be shown sticking a shovel into the ground and pretending there were going to be a million jobs created here. Oh, look at what we're doing. And again, Republicans and Democrats, the same thing. Big upturn in manufacturing was promised by Mr. Trump in his first presidency. It didn't happen. It was promised by Mr. Biden in his first presidency. And that didn't happen either. And if you go back, you'll see that none of them did it. I wanted to make sure you all understood that the people who own and operate the American manufacturing system, the capitalists whose money is invested in manufacturing facilities, have not wanted to make those investments in the United States, not even to the point of replacing what was once there, old machines with new machines old manufacturing jobs with newer high-tech jobs. They haven't even been willing to do that. 
And that's why we have the story of manufacturing that I just summarized. January 22nd was to be the first day of a week-long strike of the 29,000 teachers and support academic personnel in the California State University system. Huge system, one of the biggest in the United States, 29,000 people, that's a big chunk of the California economy. But it ended after one day. The university, which believed that the workers never would finally go out, discovered that the workers could, and the workers would, and the workers did. So the university, which couldn't find any money until the last minute, found the money. It's a basically a two-year contract with 5% increase each year. Now, I want to talk about that quickly. It does not undo what the inflation of recent years did. That inflation took back 8% of what those workers were earning. Their wages didn't go up for two or three years, but prices did, and they suffered. That's why they struck. They weren't going to let that happen again. And while 5% is modest, it starts counting from July 1st of 2023. So we're more than a quarter of the way through that contract. Twice 5% is 10%. And then within 18 months, they're going to have to do it again. Only now the union knows what it can do. And so does the university. And there were little things they got that aren't little at all. All teachers will now get 10 weeks of parental leave, paid parental leave for children, if they have them while they're working there. And of course, we still have the ugly reality that the payment to administrators of the university went up twice as fast as payment to the professors. You know what that's called? That's called running a university in a business-like manner. Exactly. You know what you get when you run it like a business? You get overpaid administrators and the price of underpaid teachers. And the university cannot function without those teachers even if the administrators can put on quite a show to pretend otherwise. Let me turn next to an item you'll see in the news a lot. The Red Sea, a very important, little understood body of water in the Middle East that is a crucial pathway for shipping. Basically, the shipping that connects Europe to Asia by means of the Suez Canal uses the Red Sea. Recently, a major political group in the country of Yemen that borders the Red Sea for a long distance, known by their tribal name Houthis, H-O-U-T-H-I-S, began threatening ships moving along this waterway with bombing, with missiles, with attacks. And they did not hesitate to explain why they should suddenly be doing this starting last November, December. They said it was in response to the horror, that's their word, of what Israel was doing to Palestinians in the Gaza Strip and in the West Bank, and clearly indicating that they would be willing to stop bothering Israeli-bound shipping from using that area if the Israelis would stop bombing and missile uh, attacks against uh, the people of Gaza 
and the West Bank. Most anxious about this is the People's Republic of China, because as the world economy shifts, the following factoid might interest you. China is the biggest shipper in the world now, and the one most threatened by anything that interrupts global shipping. That's why Secretary of State Blinken and Security Advisor Sullivan have been speaking to the Chinese and to the Iranians, asking them to use their good officers to get the Houthis to stop what they're doing. That got the United States exactly nada, nothing. So the United States, with their trusty ally, I'm being polite, Britain, to go and bomb Yemen, one of the poorest countries on the face of the earth. That got them nothing either. The bombing and the missile attacks on the shipping continue. The United States, in effect, can't stop it. What the United States could do is lean on Israel to end what the United States says is already an overdone reaction in Gaza and the West Bank. But that doesn't look like it's about to happen if you listen to Mr. Netanyahu. So that means we're going to have a long war of attrition. But here's what you might want to think about. A world in which a long war happens that has one dominant economic power, you can be pretty confident that will be the one that wins, the one that can last out a war of attrition. But that's no longer the United States. China and its allies in the BRICS are a much larger economic powerhouse. A war of attrition that hurts global shipping? Well, they can handle that better than the United States. And here's another thought. If Israel doesn't stop and the Houthis continue in the Red Sea, the shipping that can't now go through the Red Sea will have to go around the Cape of Good Horn in Africa. And that makes everything that comes here more expensive. Got to pay for many more days at sea, for many more days at work by the people who run those ships. It's not a good thing for world inflation to make a long, complex story short. Finally, Governor Abbott in Texas has decided he's not going to enforce the federal law when it comes to immigration policy. Well, immigration has for a long time been a kind of indirect way of being in favor of white people versus not white people without having to say so. So you can rail against the not white people that want to come here in the name of the white people who already are here. This is political theater and should be recognized for what it is. But if you want the economics, they're as simple as the day is long. People come here because they want a job and they want a decent life. It's the same reason that most of us ancestors came here. So why not, at a time when our unemployment is at record low, finally do what a country like ours could have and should have done long ago? Make a decent job, a decent pay, a basic human right. If it were that for people born here, and if it were that for people who got here, we wouldn't have the tension between the two of them. Stay with me. We'll be right back. Economic analysis with Michael Hudson, which I think you will find as interesting as I do. Stay with us. Welcome back, friends, to the second half of today's economic update. 
I am very proud and happy to bring to our microphones and our cameras Professor Michael Hudson. He's a little bit like me. You know, we're economists. That's what we do for a living. We study the economy. And then we pretend, like our colleagues, that we really understand what's going on and offer you a way to join us in appreciating the ironies, the contradictions, and the plain, frightening prospects of what we're looking at. Michael Hudson is a distinguished research professor of economics at the University of Missouri in Kansas City. He's also, and this makes him quite unusual, an honorary professor of economics at, and here please, I apologize for my pronunciation, Huazhong University of Science and Technology, usually known by its acronym H-U-S-T, located in Wuhan in the People's Republic of China. He has written so many books and articles that if I were to try to list them here, it would exhaust the time that we have. And I know that you're all more interested in hearing what he has to say than looking at all his very many impressive credentials. He specializes in areas of debt, finance, neoliberalism, and he has a particular interest in Middle Eastern economic history that gives his work a kind of grounding in the realities. He's also worked for American major American banks uh, and so brings in a wealth of experience uh, to the analyses he offers. So first of all, Michael Hudson, thank you very much for giving us your time and your expertise. Well, I appreciate being here. Okay, I'm going to start off with something I know has struck many of your audiences because they've spoken to me about it. You have characterized the United States economy as comprising a kind of apartheid. What exactly do you mean? And, and here what I'm after is what would stimulate you to use a term as loaded as that associated with the history of South Africa in ways most of us know to describe the U.S. economy? Well, apartheid is basically economic polarization that excludes uh, one part of the uh, population from economic growth. And economically, today's economy is polarizing between the 1% and the 99%, uh, as a lot of people are saying. Uh, but more precisely, this polarization is between creditors and debtors. Uh, the 99% of the population are, are the debtors, and the debt is growing, and the, paying this debt sucks up their income to the very top of the economic pyramid. What makes it uh, apartheid is that it's hereditary, uh, and it's become so really in the decades after uh, the return to peace in 1945. Uh, this financial polarization is largely uh, concerns about real estate. Uh, and that's why I focus on 1945. Uh, back then, uh, everybody was able to uh, return uh, to peace and uh, uh, get a home. And all they had to do was pay 25% of their income. They would get a mortgage and they would end a home. And the homes that uh, the population got in 1945 have all been bequeathed to their sons, their grandchildren. And uh, this home ownership has been hereditary, but only for white people, not really for black people. And that's where the apartheid was. Uh, from 1945 until almost 1990, almost 2000, uh, the black population could not uh, get uh, mortgages. There was uh, redlining. So uh, the result is that uh, <clears throat> the, the white population was able to buy affordable housing when you only pay 25% of your income on uh, on um, housing, on mortgage payments, or on rent, you can afford to buy goods and services. And uh, that low price of housing was really what spurred uh, the economic takeoff until uh, the 1980s when things were changed. Uh, but the black population was left out of it. Finally, they began to be 
a accepted back into it around night around uh, uh, 2000 2008 and by 2008 uh, you you had a rise finally in black and Hispanic uh, home ownership but there was one problem uh, you they had to pay much higher interest rates uh, than white people and uh, the uh, banks uh, charged them much more of their income than uh, 25 percent. Uh, even today, uh, long after 2008, uh, people have to pay uh, up to 43 percent of their income for rent. That's the level at which the government guarantees uh, the banks that uh, there is going to be a repayment. So uh, people who now are beginning to buy homes for the first time have their uh, budget squeezed. It's very hard to pay uh, pay the uh, forty three percent of your income, especially when you're also having to pay uh, student debt and bank uh, credit card credit and uh, automobile loans. So the result is that uh, when uh, families who do uh, white families as well now, even if they uh, uh, are able to uh, get access to a bank loan to buy homes of their own, they have to pay so much student debt. Uh, as a result of getting an education to get a job, to earn the income to pay the loan, that the banks say, I'm sorry, uh, you don't have enough money uh, left after the student loan to qualify for a bank loan. And so the result is that home ownership rates in America are dropping. Homeowner uh, real estate is being bought by large private capital real estate companies. And uh, the result is that uh, rent is going way up. And anyone who has to live in a, a major city or even the smaller cities finds that the rents are going up so much that as far as they're concerned, that's the real inflation that's taking place. The inflation in, uh, in housing prices, the inflation in education prices, uh, the, the inflation that basic needs that they have to cover are so high that it's pushed America into uh, an economic uh, recession uh, that really began in 2008 when uh, President Obama uh, broke his promise to write down the junk mortgages to the real realistic real estate value. The banks had been very predatory towards uh, low income borrowers, especially black and Hispanic borrowers. For the first time, they were willing to pay much higher uh, uh, portions of their income. Uh, for mortgages, but it turned out not only did they have higher rates, but the banks uh, falsified uh, the prices of the property being sold. Uh, they uh, added all sorts of charges on there. And uh, the result has been uh, that this polarization between creditors and debtors that's hurting the whole economy has taken on a racial uh, coloration in the United States. And uh, that's why I call it apartheid, but you could say that the apartheid really is between creditors and debtors in general, is the whole economy uh, is strapped for debt. You know, I'm, I'm struck just as a footnote to what you say. Last week, um, Harvard University, which has a joint center on housing, studies housing, and has been doing it for years, they issue an annual report. And I read it last week, and it, it begins with a really stunning statistic for the year 2024. One half of all renters in the United States are paying rents that they cannot afford. They keep track of what you were calling the share of income that housing absorbs. And by using that metric, that measure, half of the people are paying more than they can afford, which means they're not taking care of medical expenses or educational expenses or any of the other expenses in order to keep a roof literally over their heads. All right, let me, let me move to a, a, another but very related question. There's widespread agreement among people doing rather different uh, theoretical approaches to economics that over recent decades in the United States, the distribution of wealth and income has become much more unequal. That 40 years ago, the United States was not the extreme outlier when compared, say, to Western Europe, that it is now in the, in the sense of that kind of inequality. So my first two parts of this question, do you agree with this assessment? And if you do, 
what solutions would you come up with? How, how would you deal with a situation like this if indeed uh, you find it to be the case? Well, I'm basically an economic statistician, and all of the statistics explain quite clearly why the economy is becoming more unequal. And my book, Killing the Host, explains why. Uh, and the reason is that debt grows exponentially. It grows by compound interest uh, and an upsweep. But income doesn't grow that fast. So debt is growing much faster than the whole economy. And that means that more and more of, of corporate income, of people's income, and uh, e even uh, government income has to be paid for debt service to the financial class. So uh, it, it, as long as uh, more and more income is uh, not spent on goods and services, uh, not spent on hiring labor, not spent on building factories, as long, the re as long as the economy is deindustrializing, it's going to polarize. And the economy is deindustrializing because it's become a high cost economy because of debt. Uh, a house is worth whatever a bank is going to lend. And banks have lent more and more, increasing housing. Uh, banks lend for corporate takeovers. Uh, and uh, they that they create monopolies, and monopolies are rising prices and just sucking uh, the uh, uh, income out of the economy. And what uh, econo economists in the 19th century used to call this economic rent. Rent is unearned income. So when you say that the economy is polarizing uh, to the upper one percent, and you look at uh, what are uh, how is, what are these people doing to get all this income? They're not acting productively. They don't make their wealth by investing in uh, plant and equipment because we're deindustrializing. They don't certainly don't make their wealth by saving their wages. Uh, they make it by capital gains. In other words, by economic bubble, by uh, banks creating a financial bubble, pushing up stock market prices, pushing up bond prices with the Federal Reserve's uh, quantitative easing. So uh, the, if, uh, the 10 percent of the population owes almost 80 percent of all of the stocks and bonds. So this 10 percent is getting very wealthy and they say we're doing fine. The economy is us. Uh, the economy is doing fine. But uh, people who don't have stocks and bonds and have to depend on what they earn uh, are left behind. Well, if debt is causing the problem, what's the uh, the solution? The uh, if you there really is no way of reversing this economic polarization and making the economy more equal without wiping out a lot of the debt, wiping out the student debt, wiping out the bad uh, real estate debt that uh, uh, individuals have, not business debts, but wiping out personal debt. Uh, and the good thing about wiping out the personal debt is this wipes out the say the credit, the savings of the one percent. The savings of the one percent are lent out to the ninety nine percent. And uh, if you're going to save the ninety nine percent for debt, that means writing down all of this uh, sucking up of uh, economic rent, of capital gains, of financialization that have uh, accrued only to the one percent or top percent of the population. Well, uh, another uh, solution is to realize that housing should be a human right. There has to be a lot of housing, and housing should be made to, available today for everyone, uh, white, black, uh, everyone uh, basically should be able to uh, have housing for 25% of their income. Those are the two major uh, uh, solutions to uh, the problem. Yes, and the only footnote I can give you, Michael, is that uh, people keep wondering why when you visit China do you see huge blocks of apartments that are empty because they bring they build them in advance in order to avoid the very issue that you bring to the fore right now. I wish we had more time. We don't. Thank you, Michael Hudson, and I hope you will agree to come back and continue this kind of a conversation about an economy that certainly needs it. And to all of you... Let me remind you that I look forward to speaking with you again next week.